Okay, so now we're into part two of rehabilitation design. Um, this is gonna be a lot of this is gonna be barrier wall um, driven. There'll be some seismic stuff and slope stability stuff too. And I think as everybody knows, we have um, aging infrastructure in this in this country. This is a, this is a histogram of uh, how many dams were built in each decade starting in 1900. And we had you know the heyday was the 50s through the 70s. But even then, we got a lot of dams. You know, I think the average age is over over 50 years old of most infrastructure in the U.S. So things are aging, you know, and when things age, they settle, they behave differently, they start leaking, they start sliding. So there's going to be more rehab needed for these, and a lot of them are seepage issues. So, you know, we're on barrier walls, so we're talking about reducing seepage. Now, this is a plot from um, Dr. Bruce. He's got a lot of papers out on, on barrier walls and um, foundation improvement for dams. And this just shows kind of since Wolf Creek in 75, looking at these are big, big barrier walls. These are, these are uh, looking at hydro mills or clamshells or secant pile walls. So these are um, large concrete backfilled walls. You see, there's, there's always been a few kind of ongoing for the last, what are we going on here? Almost 50 years. And I think that trend is going to continue for a while. So it's, it's, there's been a lot of advancements in the technology and in the different technologies. There's, there's definitely different options and we're going to, we're going to go through those. So, you know, big picture concept, we're looking at putting a barrier through an embankment, through the foundation into a low permeability foundation. We want to make sure we're getting down into low permeability, just like the grounding. We don't want to have this hanging out there so that it, we can have seepage, seepage underneath it. So if you, you know, getting back to site characterization, if you have a situation where maybe it's just a portion of your embankment and your foundation you need to treat, maybe you can do a, an upstream, you know, an upstream slope, you can do part of a barrier wall, or maybe it's just a foundation issue and you do a barrier wall for the foundation and then a, a compacted clay or a liner that ties into your embankment. This might be more appropriate for like a, a concrete faced rock fill dam where you've got an upstream liner and you're just trying to treat a foundation concern. So, as I said, you do not want these things to be hanging. You want to get all the way through your permeable foundation or you'll do it again, a la Wolf Creek. So Wolf, the first Wolf Creek was done, I think 75 through 79. And when they designed it, uh, Ralph Peck was on their board of consultants. And he said, well, if you don't go deeper and longer now, you will in 30 years. And he was almost right. It was 28 years later when they had to go back and make it deeper and longer. So make sure you really understand that foundation and get through all those features. And it's got to be robust because there's the unknowns. Like we talked about this morning, there's unknowns in the foundation. It's geology. It's not a given. It's, it's what you receive. It's not a given. So there's a bunch of different types of walls. We're going to talk about continuous trench walls, soil mix walls, um, element walls, and then jet grouting. Again, I've already kind of mentioned jet grouting, not usually in dams because of hydraulic fracture risk. Again, all of these, you want to make sure you're being careful with what you're selecting and you're, what you're doing. You don't want to do, you don't want to cause damage. I know that's, I've said that a lot, but that is, that is an underpinning criteria in the Corps of Engineers dam safety regs is do no harm. So that's always in the back of our minds. And with, with jet grouting, again, it's, it's got its time and its place. It, it's, it's good for tight locations where other methods aren't viable, closure sections, spillways, spillway walls. Um, but again, you've got to, you got to be really honed in on when you're, when you're doing it. So how do you pick your, your, your method? There, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, one of them is what are you excavating? So your, your foundation you're tying into, is, is it a hard rock or is it more of a soft rock or a soil? So if you're, you're in a, a soft material, you can use a continuous trench or, or deep mixed walls. Kind of on this, the left side of the chart here, on the right side, you're more in the, in the element walls, the, the panel walls, the secant pile walls. And then there, there's just lots of factors you can go through. I'm not going to go through this whole table. It, it's, it's in your slides. Um, but, you know, there's different backfill types. You know, the, the continuous walls are generally fast. The element walls are slower. Um, the element walls can get in through harder rock. The continuous walls don't have joints. Element walls do have joints. So there, there's pluses and minuses for both of these, and they all, have their, they all have their place. So we'll start with the continuous trench barrier walls. So these are slurry-supported excavations. So you've got a um, typically like a long stick excavator that's, or a clamshell that's going to excavate a trench. It's going to be fill, filled with bentonite slurry, and that, that slurry is going to keep the trench open. You don't have any joints with these. 
because it's a continuous operation from start to finish if you do it right. There, there are times when you have to stop things and joints are things you, you deal with, but generally they're not joints. Um, there, it's not considered a structural member. Um, you, you can have some that have a, have a, a strength to them, a low strength uh, cementaceous material, but generally they're not considered a structural member. Some can be flexible depending on your backfill. And they're all low permeability, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven or less um, hydraulic permeability. Backfill types, soil bentonite is just with that. You, you take the excavated soil, mix it with the bentonite slurry, you mix it with more dry bentonite, that's your low permeability barrier. Cement bentonite is a complete replacement. You, you excavate everything out, all the materials out, and the slurry that's coming in is a cement bentonite and sometimes slag cement mix that will self-harden in the trench, and that will give you your barrier. And then soil cement bentonite is, is a mix of soil cement and bentonite. Uh, these are becoming less common because there, there's, there's issues with segregation down at the bottom of the trench that you, you don't necessarily, the mixing, the mix kind of can fall apart sometimes if it's not done right. So th there's, I think these are being done less and most everything is soil bentonite or, or cement bentonite. So this is a, a cartoon of what, what, what we're talking about here. So you got your lar large long stick excavator. Progress is going this way towards me. So it, it's, digging down to final depth. And usually this is more, more even closer to a vertical face. So we've got your low primitive layer down here, you're excavating a, a design depth into it. And usually that depth has one, two, three feet of extra depth than what your, your analysis say. Because all this is done in the blind, for lack of a better term. You're not seeing what's going on down here. So when the excavator is digging and he hits bedrock, he can tell it's, it's harder to dig. He'll actually put a sample out on the side. You look at the sample, yep, that's bedrock. You throw a weighted tape measure into this trench that's maybe 50, 60, 70 feet deep, and you sound it, and you say what the depth is. So your accuracy is plus or minus half a foot, maybe. So it, it is, it's low tech, um, but, but it works pretty well. And then on the opposite side, you've got the backfill operation. So you got other equipment over here that's mixing. This is for a soil bentonite one. They're mixing the, the soil and the bentonite and the slurry together and they're pushing it down, down into the trench. And this will actually slope out to be about a 10 to one slope, eight to one to a 10 to one slope. And it's just, you're constantly moving. You just keep pushing backfill in, you keep digging and it marches along. This excavator's out here. It's always, can, at least once or twice a day, it's grabbing the toe of this because it's gonna push sediment because you'll get some suspended solids in the slurry and that backfill is 15, 20 pounds heavier than the slurry and it'll just push it along. When you're all said and done, you've got a low permeability layer. Another way, a deeper way to look at these is your same excavator concept up here, and you have a clamshell that can get deeper. So, you know, maybe the, the excavator depth, maybe you can get 100 feet with an excavator, that's a pretty big machine. The clamshells can get a lot deeper because it's on a crane. So they, they don't have the uh, restrictions of the hydraulics of, a, of an excavator. But th these can only go through, for the most part, soil and, and sediments because you don't have down pressure to them. Some of them have some hydraulic components where they can get more of a, a bite to them, but most of it is you're just relying on the weight of this clamshell frame. And again, you're kind of just moving along. So maybe you'll do the lead-in trench with a, a backhoe and then the rest with the clamshell. And this, this one's showing a cement bentonite. So it's a comp again, complete remove and the slurry hardens in place to give you your barrier wall. So I already kind of talked about, we got long stick excavators, clamshells, and there's also, there's also trenchers too. And we'll get into trenchers a little bit later on that. So backfill equipment, this is making mud is what it is. This is not, again, this is low tech, but it, it, it's, it's a proven technology. There's been more, more barrier walls done with this method than the other ones we're gonna show. And there, there's a lot of good co contractors to do it. Has its limitations, has its purpose. Not for every dam, but it, it does work. So your equipment is a, a bulldozer, an excavator. This, this pipe right here, that's coming from your, your slurry batch plant right here. And, and they just, for soil bentonite, you're just mixing up the soil that's coming out. If you don't have enough fines in your soil, usually you want about 25% for internal stability so it doesn't bleed out. They will bring in supplemental fines. I think that's what this windrow is back here. So they'd mix in some, some fines with the excavated materials and uh, there's no bentonite bags in this one. We'll show some in a later picture. Mixed all together. And it's, 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 you test it with um, permeability, permeameter for permeability. And then field, you're doing a slump test like concrete. And there's, there's usually between a four to six inch slump. So it's pretty steep, so it, pretty stiff, so that it will still flow into the trench, but it won't run into the trench. And because you want that density to again, push that sediment out in front of your, your, your backfill profile. Uh, again, no joints, no stops. 
not really trimming. Sometimes you have to, if it's, if it's really deep or maybe when you're starting, you might have to trim me backfill down at the bottom. For the most part, it just runs down that nice eight to one, 10 to one slope. So what are some benefits of this? They're, they're low cost. You can, you can build them pretty fast. You know, this, you can get 100, 200 feet a day of production for a 60 foot deep wall. So you can go pretty quick with these. Very low permeability. Um, again, most soil types, they work. Again, if you're, if you're low on your, your fines content, you need to bring in some supplemental fines, but it, it still works pretty well. No joints. And again, it's the oldest and most, oldest technology, most installed square feet. There's a lot of qualified contractors for these continuous wall methods. So we got a couple of quick case histories. So this first one is a, is a dam. It's a 45 foot tall embankment. I think the wall depth in this was, max depth is about 55 or 58 feet to get through bedrock. Uh, a dam constructed in uh, 1908, 1909. It didn't have a cutoff, had a hydraulic fill course. This is original construction photo. This is, you know, horse and wagons. They're just harrowing soil into this water-filled trench. And that was that was our cutoff. Didn't extend to the crest. It was a, only did it for one season of the two years because I think it was just too hard. <laughs> and they started just placing fill. So this dam had a lot, you can see a lot of, a lot of seepage on the downstream side of this dam. Um, so that they identified it was a risk that needed to be addressed. So this is starting of construction. Here's your, your trench excavator. This one, again, this one we were going almost to 60 feet. The crest of the dam was degraded to about, so we had about a 75 foot wide working platform because you do need some, some ground to, to fit all your big toys on out here. Here's your slurry coming in, your fresh slurry coming in. And th there's certain specs on this. Usually I think it's 40 seconds through a marsh funnel, which is used for in, in drilling operations, but it gives you a viscosity. And this, this slurry, you know, it's about, it comes in about 75 pounds. It'll get up to about 85 pounds in there when it picks up some sediment. And then you can see it's shiny in here. The bentonite slurry will coat the trenches. So you get the weight of the slurry holding the trench open. It'll arch, you actually can arch across the trench a little bit in the slurry. And then this, this it's called a filter cake does a lot of good. It really helps hold back seepage. And it's also an added benefit. It's, it, this is really low permeability. It's thin, but it's low permeability. It gives you some benefit. You don't count for it, but it gives you benefit in your seepage reduction also. So they load up, excavate, take this material. This was wasted and they, they had a, a complete borrow source. This was hundred percent waste, hundred percent back in. So they had a borrow stockpile over here. Again, making mud. So you got a couple dozers. They actually had two different um, batches there it'd work at a time so you'd know you'd have a set number of set amount of soil coming in these are 2,000 pounds of bentonite bags you know how much bentonite to add you have a mix design beforehand saying we need four percent five percent dry bentonite addition the slurry is about six percent bentonite when it comes in so between the slurry and the bentonite you just mix it all up you get this nice well mixed mud pie and they would put it in a truck and this is this is the start of the leading trench and just dump it in about a four foot drop we, we would hold into and here going back the trench keeps going back off to the distance there and this is the start of that lead in and then it goes to 10 to one down and this is just a continual operation every day they would, weren't doing night shifts just day shifts and then so each morning each evening you do a profile of this whole trench to know where the where the backfill is in the from the, in the evening and you go to the morning and if it's the same great if it changed you say oh if it came, the profile came up well but you had collapse Okay, now we have to go back, got to find that collapse, we got to remove that material. So we still have a, a continuous barrier through there. I don't think we had any collapse issues on this one, but it is something that can happen when you, especially if you're dealing with some more granular or gravelly materials. The next one for a same type of technology, but a cement bentonite backfill. This is A.B. Watkins. I think this was talked about earlier, briefly about, about this one. So this is a reclamation dam out in Utah. It's 14 miles long, so it's just a just a little one. Um, not very tall, 36 feet, um, 20 feet in the incident area. So in 2006, there was uh, this is what I do remember. So there was a farmer. I think Cassie said it yesterday. The farmer actually saw the event going on. He saw the sand in this ditch right here. And if they wouldn't have seen that, this may have failed. But they saw it, able to rehab it. Stop it. You can this this actually here's this right here. This is what they did. They pushed out material upstream to choke it off and they built a filter. And this is this is what was going on from a failure mode. So we've got a 
embankment sitting on silty and sand, silt and silty sand. And then you got a clay layer down here. And the, the, the thing that silt and sand usually doesn't hold roofs, but there was this caliche layer down at depth that would actually hold a roof. So there was material eroding out in the ditch and it was, it eroded back into the reservoir. I think it had make, actually made connection. Starting to collapse here in the downstream side, that pipe started to collapse. And this is when they found it starting getting cracks in the embankment. And again, they were able to push the material in the upstream to, to fill this in and then put a filter in the downstream and stop it. And they realized they have this condition for miles of the dam. So their solution was to come in and do an excavator dug cement, bar cement bentonite barrier wall. So this is, I think this is pretty much right where they're starting. So this one is just the big, the big excavator. Um, complete waste, you see everything's coming out of the material, everything's coming out of the trench. And then this is just your, your fresh slurry pipe coming in, which is that cement, bentonite, and I can't remember if this one had slag cement or not, but it sets up in about a day and you can walk on it. Here, you can see you've got just thousands of feet of trench going. Here's, here's a, your mixing, mixing area. These are a couple of cement silos and bringing a bentonite bag over here. Slurry again, slurry coming in. Lots of pictures of trenches and big equipment. Here's a little, another shot of the mixing. So you got the cement silos. So your, your cement and water is mixed in, then you're actually adding the bentonite slurry. This is a, a, a jet shear mixer. So it, it really, really can mix things fast. You still, oh, you still need to sit in a pond to hydrate because that bentonite does take, need some contact time with that water. Even though it's mixed in really well, it still needs some contact time. So you let, you let it sit for a little while and they're, and they're always doing testing. That's what this guy's doing right here. He's testing that slurry to make sure we've got the, the right um, viscosity and unit weight in the slurry. And here's just another, another shot of the same op, at operation. Again, cement and water coming into the shear mixer and then out into the pond. Okay, next, next technology. This is, this is a, a mix in place technology, cement deep soil mixing. And, and there's a lot of different technologies that are, are similar, but they have their different nuances. But pretty much all of them rely on, you're gonna mix what is out there in situ soils with cement, bentonite, grout, or, or, or other components, if depending on what you're trying to get to, strength, permeability, what, whatever you're trying to get to. So you've got multiple mixing tools with cutting heads and paddles. And, and it makes, some of them mix horizontally, some of them mix more vertically. So you gotta think about what, what are you trying to achieve? Um, where are you targeting zones? You tar targeting the whole thing? How do, you, how do you want this mix? They all have their, uh, their, ad, their pluses and minuses. So we're gonna go through, I think three different technologies here. They're all tried out at Herbert Hoover Dyke. It's a, it's a core project down in uh, South Florida. And there was a, a lot of seepage rehabilitation done on this dike. And there's a lot of test sections done. And, and all three of these methods worked really well. They're different technologies, but they all ended up with, with, with a, good, a good finished product. So the, the cutter soil mixing is this type of event. So you've got two wheels that are mixing. They can, they can spin both directions. I think different manufacturers have to spin different ways. And what, what, you're, what you do is you just take this, you lower it down into the ground, you do a panel, you do another panel, and then you come back and cut in, in between the previous panels to get your continuous wall. So you see, we, we have, we'd have a, a joint here, but we overlap to cut that joint out. So you, you always want to excavate into the previously placed or previously mixed material so that you don't have joints. Um, you know, the, these were, looks like we we're, were overlapping a, a couple inches on each side. And I think these are about a two, two foot wide wall. Pretty, not a whole lot of equipment. You've got your, your, your mixing equipment, or sorry, your, your ground mixer, and then you just you have your batch plant over here that's batching whatever, your cement, your bentonite, whatever mix you need. And, and you, you'd be doing mixed designs. You're gonna go out and drill and sample this beforehand, mix it with cement and bentonite, do permeability tests, do strength tests, so that you know how much cement and bentonite you need to be adding while you're mixing. And then there'd be post verification for all these different types. So you're gonna go back in and you're gonna drill down through, grab some samples. Now there are some risks with that because I think they saw, in some of these I saw they'd drill through these and then it would relax a little bit and they'd see some cracking. 
it was superficial cracking, but they're seeing some cracking. They do water pressure tests. It was no take, but the optical televiewer was saying, oh, we got cracks. Well, I think it was more of just a relaxation of the hole than necessarily a defect in the wall. So, uh, so this one really is gonna mix. You're going up and down, but it's pretty much mixing more in a horizontal direction because it's not carrying material up or down. Maybe there's a little verticality mixing to it, but it's mostly you're mixing horizontal as you're lowering it. So triple auger, really aptly named, three augers with paddles. So same concept, you're, you're doing primary panels and then secondaries come in between them to connect the primary panels. Again, this one is more of a horizontal mix type. You've got just these paddles that will sit down there and mix with each other. You're injecting cement, and bentonite in a slurry form, and you mix it together to get your, your backfill mix. Again, you wanna make sure you have overlap. So I'm not sure, these are, oh, it's in millimeters. There you go, 21 to 14 and a half inches was what was a width on this one. And that, that's, that's pretty common, that one and a half to maybe two foot width um, for this type. The, the excavator dug ones are usually closer to a three foot wide width. Again, same, same concept, panels, overlapping panels, low permeability, have a mix design, same, same process for all these technologies for your, your prep work and your after work. And then the last one, this is, there's two different, this is a Hayward Baker option. There, there's two different companies I know that do this. This, they call it a trench cutting remix, remixing deep wall method, TRD. DeWind is another contractor that does something similar to this. Similar concept, different type of equipment, but, but similar product. This does more of a vertical mix. So it's, it's, a, it's a chainsaw, for lack of a better term. It's a big chainsaw that will just go in the ground and it'll just, it'll churn. And you're mix, again, you're mixing your bentonite slurry and your cement slurry. And as you, it's kind of a one pass, you come through and you've got a, a mixed wall. So this is one where if you do have, you know, you're worried about contacts or different layers, it gives you a, a fully mixed wall vertically, not just a horizontal. Um, so there can be some benefits to that, but um, they, and these can sometimes have some issues on some of these, these harder ones where the, the, the chainsaw will get cut, can get hung up on some of these hard, harder units. Um, the, the triple auger isn't really great in a, in a, hard, in a harder, well, a bedrock that's got some strength to it because it's just an auger. The cutter soil mixing does pretty good. It's pretty aggressive. It can, it can cut through, I think, more than the other two. So here's the, the, the TRD in work. So here's an excavator, which is a pretty good piece of equipment, and it's dwarfed by this TRD over here. So it is a big machine that can, well, it's a big chainsaw. Again, same, same concept. You got your, your batch plant back here with your cement and your bentonite, and then just a slurry hose coming into your machine and, and mixing. So on this one, they did some, some post-installation verification. They actually went and dug trenches around this. I think they did this for all three methods. Just to see, okay, is it continuous? How does it look? Is it, was it, is it formed up? So we see you got a nice, nice even wall here on the top and you look down the sides and man, it, it, it looks like it's formed almost. It, it, it did, a, it, it held its, it's held its ground pretty well. So we've got a Socrative question now. So our question this time, what seepage rehabilitation method is preferred. This is another one of those select all that apply because I kind of like those, I guess. And I get in trouble for liking those, but I like those. So collection, filters and drains, reduction barriers, both or whatever you can afford. All right, well, we'll just talk about it. So yeah, this is a trick question, kind of. So ideally, if you can, and I think I said this earlier, if you can do both, with new designs, you do both. You have seepage reduction and seepage control. With a rehab, if you, do, if you can do it, you do both. There's cost implications to that. Next, personal preference, I think filters and drains over, over a barrier. I think it's more robust, you can see it. That filter, you have more confidence in that, with something that you can see versus something that's underground, which you still have good confidence in. But this, a filter is really, really robust. Now there are issues where filters may not work if you have large flow rates and it's gonna overwhelm your filter, you may need a barrier and that may be an option to go instead of a filter. And cost does, cost and risk do, do play into this. Um, like 
both could be very expensive depending on the size of the structure. Um, so you really need to look and see what fits for your dam and for your site. But keeping all the things in mind we've talked about here the last few days of, okay, what are your problems? How do you address them? And what's right for our site? So element barrier walls. These are the, the big ones. These are the, the deep ones. These are the ones that go into hard rock. These are what you do when you have karst. This stuff, because you put in a higher strength concrete. There's a, you know, the, the sl second slide I showed, showed a bunch of them. Here's another a list of them. These are, I think these are Reclamation and Corps of Engineers barrier walls. Um, you know, 420 foot deep in Mud Mountain in Washington. I think that's, I think that's still the deepest one. Um, there was talk of doing one at Mosul, but I think that's gone away, but maybe not. So same thing, slurry supported excavation. You start with a clamshell to get you through your, your embankment and if you have any, you know, superficial soils. You'll have guide walls at the top. It's a big, heavy piece of equipment. You want this thing starting off in a vertical alignment when you're, when you're, when you're going. Um, Pre-grouting. This is something that is, I think, really much pretty much become the standard of care here in the last 20, or, 20 years or so. Mostly in karst conditions where you can have a lot of seepage forces and a lot of seepage flow really good in hard rock and usually you have a higher strength backfill a concrete you know 3000 4000 psi mix and this would be trimming to the bottom of your excavation and then displacing the slurry as it comes up just like the mixed ones we talked about that primary and, and secondary panels this has a, the same the same set you've got primary and secondary panels again making sure you take a bite out of each of your previous primaries and have overlap so that you take that joint out of there and they can actually control these. And even though it's hanging from a crane, they can control these. There, there's little pads on them where they can control which way it's going um, to maintain that continuous wall. And they've got, they've got great instruments on them and tell them where you're going to make, main, maintain that connectivity with your adjacent panels. And then there's also measurements you'll do after you pull the, the hydro mill out of the ground, you'll put down, they'll do something called a code in, it's an ultrasonic, uh, I think like a fish finder, the depth finder. And, and they'll, they'll run these surveys and make sure that everything's lining up so you don't have a gap in your wall. Because that's the last thing you want is to have an opening at your wall at depth where you're trying to cut off a karst feature. So a little schematic of, of how all this works. So the clamshell comes through and it does its passes and makes a, two panels and gets the middle out. So you've got a couple panels open. Hydro mill comes in the open excavation from the clamshell grinds its way through bedrock to total depth, again, in panels. And then you bring your concrete truck, trimmy up your grout. So now you've got your first, your first set of panels done. You still got these soil and bedrock knobs in between. Those are your secondary panels. So come back, your clamshell comes back down through, gets you down to bedrock. Hydro mill gets you down to total depth and then backfill with grout and you've got a, a continuous barrier wall. So the clamshell would just fit in that soil profile and the hydro mill will actually cut into the adjoining concrete. And that's, you know, three, 4,000 PSI concrete, but this bedrock down here could be 20,000 PSI. So the concrete is not the restricting factor in the, in the cutting operations. So a few photos, most of these I think came from Mr. Sinawa Dam, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So this is a clamshell. This is just a gravity clamshell, um, no hydraulics to it. You can see the, the cabling on it. It'll open up, take a bite, you drop it down, Take a bite, and it's all all gravity, gravity uh, opening and closing. So there are some that do have hydraulics, so they can they can they do have some some digging side to them, like like an excavator bucket, where they can actually dig a little bit besides just beyond what what the the gravity gravity force will do. So this is the hydro mill, hydro phrase hydro mill, on a big crane. Um, you've got a couple different wheels back here. One is for a slurry line, where you're you bring in two slurry and bring in fresh slurry and then actually take take out um, cuttings and then the, the, all the cabling will raise and lower this this massive machine so you got this very big steel steel frame your your cutter heads down here we got a closer up photo here coming up um, these are very very aggressive you they've got teeth on them you replace them quite frequently if you're in really hard rock and then there's a, a port down here to, that as you're cutting it, it's pulling out that that slurry and that sediment in, into a pump that again goes up this slurry line back to the 
top of the rig and then off for, for treatment. Here's your hydraulic lines on the sides. And then these, these brown parts on here, these are those, those pads I was talking about. That's how you can help steer it. And they can see this in the cab, which if they're getting out of line, and keep this thing, keep this thing vertical and in line with the, the, with the adjacent uh, panels. And then everything else is just hoist block and there's a lot of, a lot of instrumentation on board in here, a gimbal to make sure they know their orientation. This is a close up of these teeth. Um, they're, they're aggressive. I mean, they're meant to go through really hard rock. That, that's, that's what they do. Here's these pads, these hydraulics they can use to, to steer it as they need to. But the, these can go through hard rock. These are, they can, they can go to great depths. They're also very expensive. And just getting one to your site is a very large cost. So they're not usually cost effective on small jobs because you spend more getting the machine to the job than what it costs to actually do the job. So this is a little more of the, the rest of the plant operation. So you've got the, the hydro mill down here, down here and then the slurry line coming up back to the machine. It comes to a, a uh, mud processing plant where it'll actually separate out the sediment side and then the fresh slurry goes back into it or the used slurry goes back into a tank and they'll add it more fresh supplemental slurry and then back down into the hole. And, and so they're reusing as much slurry as they can while taking out the, the sediments so that the, you have fresh slurry supporting the trench and not, not sediments messing with your, with your excavation. So Mississinawa Dam, uh, this is another case history we'll talk about. This is a, a dam built in uh, 62 to 67. It's 140 feet long, about 8,000 feet long in, in Indiana. Um, its max design capacity is 360,000 or so acre feet with a normal capacity of 75. So it's still got a good sized pool behind it. And it's, it was built in the 60s and it started having issues pretty quickly thereafter. Um, in 88, they actually saw the guardrail was dipping on the crest. So they're getting, they're, they're getting some settlement. And the, uh, the geology is limestone and it, it, it's highly fractured. They, when they're doing construction, this is, so the center line of the dam is actually right, right about here. It's the center line of the dam. So even from this aerial photo, here's one, here's a big crane and probably a, I don't know, 30 foot diameter tunnel. And you've got this huge opening in the side of your, side of your outlet works tunnel. So you've got this big solution feature. There are lots of other um, fractures in, in this karst that are, are filled with clay. And just there's a lot, of, a lot of open open area for water to move. So this is that feature, a little close up. So you know, six foot or so. So I mean, this is this is large, and you can kind of see the back wall there. But it, it's a it's a big feature. It looks like it's probably filled with clay and and, and some gouge. So they started seeing settlement. They decided they did did a bunch of investigations. Said okay, we need to we're gonna do a barrier wall. We we've got We've got karst issues. We need to get, get a concrete cutoff wall through this. So they did a test section with just a barrier wall. They had a hydro mill and, and they, were, they started drilling it, started excavating out, and then they had a massive slurry loss during the test section where they lost 150 cubic yards of slurry, which is a lot of liquid. And then they kept fighting it and they lost another 80,000 gallons of slurry. And then they started whatever, they, they threw 60 hay bales into it. They threw 460 bags of bentonite into it. And then finally 160 cubic yards of sand stopped it from losing slurry. So it was, a, it was whatever they could find they were throwing in this trench to try to get it to seal off. And that's where the decision and now the standard of care to pre-treat with grouting came from because of this incident when they were doing this barrier wall. And so they came back and they had, they had to do another exploration program to, to do grouting and then they grouted, grouted the alignment. And then the grouting also gives you more data for your barrier wall. Because now you've got you know, holes every five, 10, 15 feet, something like that. So you have a really good profile on top of bedrock. You know when you lose, get to better conductivity. So it gives you a very good profile for when you're coming back with the hydro mill. And then it also reduces that conductivity so you don't get those massive slurry losses during the barrier wall operation. So when they were doing the hydro, the, Hydro mill part, there's several cranes out here. I don't have some pictures in here, but they, they had a couple incidents. One of these actually fell over. 
down the face of the dam. Another one caught on fire. So they're not without issue, just normal, I guess, construction issues, but you can get issues. So they had, looks like about three mills out here at, the, at this time. So this is, this is the profile. So this in the red box is where they did the wall. And the blue, the red was the original design depth. And when they came back and did the grouting, they said, oh, we've got features here we got to chase. And then they, they chased a feature down here. So they went from 140 feet, 147 to 235 feet total depth chasing this feature. But if they wouldn't have, they'd be back doing it again. And then, you know, from critical areas, outlet works, and then the old valley bottom. But really, this was, this was an unknown until they did the grouting. And chances are, they wouldn't have done the pre-grouting, they probably never would have found that. The hydro mill would have just, unless they had a slurry loss, they probably wouldn't have found that. So another type of element wall are secant piles. And, and these are the original element walls. The hydro phrase is, is, the, is the newer, bigger one. And this is just what it is. It's a secant pile. You know, it's a circular wall. And there, there's two different ways you can do them. You can just overlap secant piles, or you do this, this dog bone where you've got two secant piles and then, then a hydro, hydro mill in between it to connect the two. Um, th this is, with the circular ones, you've got to sometimes have quite a bit of overlap to make sure you have, you know, your required thickness. So you, you look at this, there's, there's not much new, you know, there's not much blue between the red. So you're, you're over digging a lot in a secant pile wall as compared to an element wall where you're just doing a little bit of a, a bite into it. Um, but sometimes the secant pile walls, you can control those because they're a smaller feature. Maybe you can control them a little better than a hydro mill, but hydro mills have good control too. So just a, another, another technology that is work. I think this was the first Wolf Creek was a secant pile. Jet grouting. I don't think I'm going to talk too much. I've got more slides on it, but just be careful with it. Um, again, not typically used in dam rehab. Um, works in soils really well. A and you can get various diameters. Um, it, it can, you can get you, you can get good contact onto existing features, existing concrete structures if you're working next to a structure. And it's small, it's mobile. You can get into to tight working areas. I know the Corps uses them on levees for closure sections, like under, under bridges. You know, this, is, this is a dams course, but that's you know, where you can use some of these. So maybe it's, it, it can be used around, around some of your structures. But again, be careful because you got a risk for hydrofracture here. So now we're going to talk about some in, modifications due to instability. So a lot of these are related to seismic. That's a lot of our instability issues that could have a loss of life impact. There are a lot of rehab stability issues that we do generally don't lead to a loss of life. They're an incident, not a, not a failure mechanism. Um, and a lot of the, the static instability is usually a, a fully softened situation. I think Brian talked about that a couple days ago. High plastic clays, they weather over time. You get shallow slides that are maybe one to three or four meters deep. So again, not necessarily taking out the crest of your dam, but still causing a lot of concern. Or, as we talked earlier, seepage. If you if you've got seepage coming out of embankment, you're you could have stability issues. And if you address the seepage, so if we take care of the seepage, we have a chimney drain. We probably don't have stability issues. So do do the do the chimney drain. And with with the fully softened, those high plastic soils, usually you're looking at going with flat slopes, or you can do some amendments with lime. Um, you got to be careful with lime. You get too much lime, you can make it a brittle material, and it's more prone, prone to, to cracking. So there's, there's trade-offs in, in, in amending those, those soils. From a seismic modifications, um, different option to do here. You can remove and replace. This is talking maybe more about a, a liquefiable material at your toe. Um, or I think Brian was talking about doing, doing shear keys. You know, you, maybe you have to do some shear keys for the, a liquefaction concern. Uh, you can also, you know, try to improve in place or reinforce in place, or also, you know, building berms or buttresses or having sacrificial portions of your bankment. And then also if you have faults in your foundation, which a lot of valleys, not a lot, some valleys are, are formed because you've got faulting there and the river exploited the, the damaged bedrock and cut through there and there's faulting there. So you might have faults in your foundation. How do you deal with those if it's an active fault and you have potential for offset? So excavate and replace. 
kind of looks like a tow drain, right? We just take out the liquefiable material, place it in. Maybe we're flattening our slope a little bit or replacing some of our downstream slope. So you're just disrupting that, that, that liquefaction limits. So for doing stuff in situ improvement or reinforcement, again, same th thought. Do no harm. Don't put in new failure mode. So think through what you're doing a little bit wider because it's maybe it's not 100% replacement. You're just improving portions of it, you know, such as a dynamic compaction type method to increase density. Um, vibro compaction piles, uh, you know, these are, you're, you're densifying the soil, actually adding sand or gravel. Again, things you got to think about at a dam. Do you want to be adding gravel columns at the toe of your dam? Um, so soil reinforcement, you know, can we do reinforcement, reinforcing elements? These would maybe be secant, secant piles. Probably still need a berm over the top of them uh, just to, to cover them and give them some confining stress. You don't want to worry about um, slip surfaces that come out short from your reinforcing elements. And then this is another case history. This is... Mormon Island Dam, this is uh, out in California by Sacramento. Um, they had a pretty large dam, filters, a lot of thick alluvium. The dam was down to bedrock. And this was liquefiable materials. This is what it looks like from the air. So here's a dam, we got a pool. So this is where you think about risk and consequences. We got a pool sitting here and we just did an excavation down to bedrock. You wanna make sure you understand groundwater conditions understand the behavior of this dam and have, you know, mitigation measures ready in place in case something goes wrong in one of these holes. Nothing went wrong, it went well, they planned it out well, but just things you think about, you plan for, plan for the, plan for the worst. So we've got big deep excavations. Well, that is hard to see in the screen. But there's the bottom down there. All these whalers and struts, this is actually air. They're pumping air down here so, so they can, the guys can have fresh air. And these are all Seeking piles, and so they drilled seeking piles, and then they'd start lowering the excavation, put in whalers and struts, and take it all the way down, clean it up, and then bring bring the fill back in, take the reinforcement out, and you're left with the the uh, seeking piles and a, and a really strong granular fill a liquefaction. So this is kind of another concept: is okay, we're gonna we have a replacement zone, but we still need a berm. Just making it bigger, kind of similar to what we just shot, saw, but we're doing a remove and replace. Um, this is one a sacrificial upstream slope. You know, this is I've never done something like this, um, but it's where you you build up the downstream part of the, take out the look file material downstream, widen your dam out. You've got to really whatever you do with this, you're assuming you're going to get some sloughing upstream. This might be something you do for a reservoir you can't take offline. This whole concept seems a little sketchy to me. I'm just going to say that. I, I can't really fully endorse this concept, but it's something we're talking about. So you build up the downstream and you just assume that the upstream is going to slough away in an earthquake. It's, it's a concept. If you can't take your... ...understand how are you tying seepage control in, how are you tying seepage collection in, make sure all those things go together. So fault offset treatment. We got an active fault under a dam. Um, David's gonna talk here shortly about, about Isabella where they had that. So I've got a, I'm not gonna give away his whole talk, um, but usually you have wide filters to accommodate whatever your anticipated fault rupture movement is. This is a fault rupture scenario. So this is from Isabella. They had 14 foot thick um, filter and drain materials. They're anticipating you know, 2.7, feet, 2.7 meters, sorry, of horizontal movement, 1.3 of vertical movement, three meters oblique. So a lot of movement on this fault. And this is where Greg was saying earlier, we've got the, this vertical section at the end for the rays to get, get that filter up as high as we can. So static slope instability, again, we already talked about it's usually with control of the water. Control the water, control the problem. And we talked about fully, seafened, fully softened shrink and high plastic materials. Generally, this comes into with over steep and slopes. If you have flat enough slopes, it's usually not a problem. But if you're doing these high plastic clays and a two to one or maybe a three to one slope, maybe, maybe even a four to one, you, over time they weather. And um, oh, I can't think of a person. There's somebody in London who really, who really pioneered the work through this. And then 
Um, Danny McCook, who worked for NRCS, did a lot of work in the levees down in Texas and Oklahoma and, and really fully developed kind of this, this scenario. And, and Brian talked about the testing for it uh, in earlier sections. And also you can have you know, poorly compacted material issues um, with static stability. And you're just, maybe you're just doing a buttress, you're doing filters, addressing. Again, most of these static stabilities, for the most part, they're more incidents, not necessarily full on failures with life safety. But that being said, you have a slope failure in a dam, it gets a lot of attention. So you still don't want it to happen. So conclusion, just like with new design and with Greg, you know, there's, there is no one size fits all. You, you understand your site, understand your foundation, understand your dam, and you grab the pieces and parts that work for it and then innovate in between. You know, I've already said expect the unexpected. So plan for the worst. When you get the best, it just, it goes better. And then do no harm. <laughs>